that the role of the BBC in the 21st century, its role as a publicly funded broadcaster, its place in the public square and public life, is now highly contentious and of great significance. Mark has given us now a more specific title to the lecture, which we build more widely. And that specific title is The BBC and Public Space. We're enormously grateful that he has found time and space in what's an extremely busy schedule to come and speak here this evening. We're very honoured that he has done this. And I think you will agree that a lecture on the BBC and public space is of enormous importance as we think about the common good in this society. So we welcome you most warmly this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm very honoured to be here. Um, it's been a fairly typical seven days uh, in the life of the BBC as Director General. Um, uh, some quite good stuff on the air, I have to say, I think. Uh, David Attenborough's life, um, history of Christianity, Dermot McCullough, we were talking about that a few minutes ago, um, in our time. Um, uh, but all sorts of stuff. Dr. Bill last night, well, fine, but good, I thought. Um, uh, but behind the scenes, all sorts of other stuff. Um, we published uh, on our website, we're going to do from now on, a vast amount of information about executive pay and about uh, expenses, which attracted uh, attention last week. Um, in addition, a uh, bit of a crisis of question time, David Dimblebeek, which uh, struck by one of his wife's bullocks, if I can put it like that, and uh, has missed the programme. We've, we've got an FOI request um, about fruit. Uh, we have about two and a half thousand FOI requests. We've got a freedom of information request about the fruit of the BBC. Um, how much fruit? Um, uh, um, uh, presumably, the question is how much we consume. But I think the answer is we consume a very small amount and produce a cornucopia of fruit. Um, and finally, I suppose, one, one slightly brighter spot. Um, for some reason, known only to themselves, Forbes magazine last week decided that I was the 65th most powerful person on the planet. Uh, <laughs> I have to say, I went home and uh, explained to my children that it's a good day when I feel like the 65th most powerful person in the BBC. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, as, you, as you've heard, I'm going to try and talk this afternoon um, about what I want to call the battle for public space. Um, it's often presented as if it's a battle, an argument, specifically about public service broadcasting or about the BBC, about its scale and scope, its future direction. But to me, public space and the disputes about public space touch on much wider issues as well, about the way our democracy works, about how the public can get trustworthy, impartial information and take part in free and meaningful debate about the great issues of the day. It touches on the question of broader cultural and educational space, its breadth, its approachability, its availability to all. Perhaps it even touches on the kind of society we want, whether closed or open, certain or questioning, self-referential, or engaged in an encounter with other perspectives and other cultures. Now, in a few minutes, I'll, I'll turn to what the battle for public space feels like on the ground if you do my job. The answer would be quite often fairly uncomfortable. And then I'll and look ahead to see how this idea of public space is influencing our future plans at the BBC. But I want to begin with the debate itself, the ideological debate. And perhaps one place to start, a good place I think, is with the case for the prosecution, which has probably never been, certainly in the context of broadcasting, more eloquently and trenchantly expressed than it was by James Murdoch in his McTaggart lecture at the Edinburgh Television Festival in <coughs> August. With all its faults, and, and they are many, mm. British TV, not just from the BBC, but from ITV, Channel 4, Fi, Sky, and others, probably remains, in, in, in toto, the most admired in the world. But in his lecture, James Murdoch described it as the Adams family of world media. 
you'll have to decide for yourself whether that makes you Gomez or Uncle Fester. Um, what James objects to in the UK broadcasting system is the level of regulation and the level of public intervention. So Ofcom, the media regulator, came with some heavy criticism. But James reserved most of his strongest remarks for the BBC, for its dominance, its market impact, for its malign, and to use his word, Orwellian influence on the whole of UK media. Now, commercial media players have been suspicious and critical of the BBC since its foundation. In the 1920s, the regional newspaper groups in this, in this country ran a successful campaign to stop the BBC broadcasting any news on the radio before 7 o'clock at night because they feared it would hit the sale of the evening newspapers. And by the way, at the same time, in Australia, James's grandfather, Keith Murdoch, so Keith Murdoch was running a campaign to stop the Australian Broadcasting Corporation broadcasting news at all. People think that James is a second generation critic of public sector broadcasting or wrong, he's a third generation critic. But things have changed. The distress, and in some cases the near collapse of many commercial media business models, combined with digital convergence, which has led newspaper groups to think of the BBC as a direct competitor to them on the web, means that the anxiety and criticism is probably more intense today than it's ever been. Now, the debate about the boundaries of what the BBC should do, about how best to unlock the immense potential of the BBC to create positive public value to its news, its documentaries, its arts output, its children's programmes, and to do it without excessive adverse market impact, that debate is clearly legitimate and indeed is important and the BBC should and indeed does engage with it. But James Murdoch's speech went a good deal further than this and it questioned whether any form of public intervention in media is ever justified. Let me quote the end of his speech. James is talking here about how best to ensure independence in journalism. Having rejected models like the licence we funded BBC, James says, quote, on the contrary, independence is characterised by the absence of the apparatus of supervision and dependency, independence of faction, industrial or political, independence of subsidy, gift and patronage. There is an inescapable conclusion we must reach if we are to have a better society. The only reliable, durable and perpetual guarantor of independence is profit. <laughs> Note the ambition in James's words. He, quite correctly in my view, believes that the stakes are very high. Independent journalism can lead not just to better informed readers or viewers, but to a better society. And his proposition is a simple one, that only an unregulated free market can guarantee editorial independence, choice and quality, and that there's no space between this market and the state. Media properties are either commercial and they're therefore truly free, or they are state-sponsored, state-controlled, and therefore not just paternalistic, but authoritarian. You have to choose. And in James's view, in so many ways, with the BBC, Channel 4, Ofcom, the rest of public service broadcasting, Britain has made the wrong choice. Now, it's true that a free market in media can be a powerful stimulus for quality, diversity, and freedom of speech. The energy and the extraordinary range of the British press is testament to that. But James's argument is not that a free market approach to media is one way of guaranteeing journalistic independence, but that it is the only way. But anyone tempted to believe that commercial media players always put the interests of independent journalism above their own commercial interests should look at how they cover themselves when they're in the news. <coughs> At the BBC, we try to cover BBC stories in exactly the same way as we cover any other British institution which is in the news. And when I'm being interviewed, let's say by John Humphreys or Sarah Montague on the Today programme, I certainly can't detect, believe me, that they're holding back in any way. <laughs> Anything you could say? Au contraire. But compare that with most other broadcasters and with the majority of our newspapers. But the most important thing I want to say to James Murdoch is that in this country we have a different tradition. A tradition that denies that there are only two ways of delivering media or culture. 
and that everything is either through the untravelled market or through state control. Not just with the BBC and the other PSBs, but with universities like this one, magnificently transformed Ashmolean next door, and all our other museums and galleries, many of our orchestras, the RSC, the National Theatre, our great national parks, more broadly our educational and health systems. In fact, so much of our collective cultural and social life exists not in James's bipolar universe of market and state, but in a third space, public space. Public space is not for profit space not by accident, but by design. It exists not to make money, but to serve the public. And it is accountable to them, not just the customers, in James Murdoch's formulation, but as citizens. Wherever it can be, and certainly in the case of the BBC, public space is free of the point of use. And the more people who use it, the better. Consider, in the context of broadcasting, the contrast between the availability of music and arts on the Sky Arts channel and BBC television. Now, Sky Arts is one of the most positive developments <coughs> in multi-channel television. It has some brilliant programming. It extends the choice and range of music and arts available on TV. In a typical seven days, it reaches perhaps half a million people. But art on the BBC is simply of a different order. To quote just one statistic, this summer, more than 12 million people in this country sampled the proms on BBC television before the last night. I'm talking about BBC Television. Radio 3, of course, is devoted to classical music and the proms. But this is 12 million people bumping into the, the, the promenade concerts on BBC Television, not counting the last night. I don't want to claim any special credit for that. The BBC exists exactly to make the arts universally available. Sky does not. But it's true, I think. Private space focuses on the minority who already have a taste for the arts, public space always tries to reach out across the population. In the case of the BBC, there's another important characteristic. There's no demand curve and no exclusion. You can't buy a better service from the BBC, no matter how wealthy you are. And you can't stop people who are less well off than you enjoying just as good a service as you do. Public space is shared space. That, by the way, is why we will never erect a pay zone around our news on the web. Always be available for people here and around the world to use and find if they want to find it. That's why we will fight tooth and nail to preserve our broad public remit with a broad range of programmes, from this year's poetry season across TV and radio to Strictly Come Dancing. But contrary to James's view, public space is also independent space. <coughs> How can that be, he says, when you're state-sponsored and state-controlled? In James's universe, you'd never be able to slip a cigarette paper between the BBC and the government of the day. Every night, there will be glowing and obsequious reports about the Prime Minister's diary for the day. The Hutton crisis could never have happened. No scandal, no crisis, no inquiry, no resignations. The wars in Iraq and Afghanistan would have been covered on the BBC with deference and without debate. Now clearly there are still countries in the world where state broadcasters behave exactly like that, but for anyone with eyes to see and ears to hear, Britain is not one of them. The public believe in the editorial of independence of the BBC and they trust us. James Murdoch called his speech the absence of trust, the argument being that we have a system that doesn't trust the public to make free choices to consumers, and which therefore is a system which the public themselves <coughs> cannot have any trust in. And again, we need a reality check. Public pride and the trust in the BBC has actually grown, not diminished, over the past five years. In an ICM poll in September for The Guardian, nearly 80% of the public said they thought this country should be proud of the BBC. 69% of those polled said they thought the BBC was trustworthy. That's a number which is 9% up on five years ago. The equivalent figure for British politicians, by the way, do you trust this country's politicians, is 13%, one three. And the BBC is more trusted in Sky Homes than Sky is. So much of the current discourse is based on the assumption that support for the BBC and what it stands for, 
for the license fee and for other forms of public service broadcasting is in decline. It isn't. Our own research, our own conversations with the audience confirm public support is strong and it has been getting stronger. More than that, the assumption that as choice expanded, that the market failure argument for public service intervention will progressively diminish, and that the BBC and the licensee will prove increasingly irrelevant because so much choice was available from the commercial suppliers, has turned out to be the opposite of the case. In reality, market failure in media is growing and threatening areas of creative activity on which the public here and around the world have come to rely. Some examples. All but the very biggest and most powerful commercial media players are finding it harder and harder to justify the investment which global news gathering requires. The world needs outstanding and objective reporting of international events, now more than ever, but commercial imperatives are forcing even one strong media outlet to cut back. When I started in journalism, the US networks had some of the most formidable news operations in the world. Today, foreign news plays a smaller and smaller part in their main bulletins. One, newspaper, one, one American news executive told me recently, our audiences just find foreign news dispiriting. Um, as a result, for example, when Benazir Bhutto was assassinated in Islamabad, the networks covered it from Baghdad, because that's the closest they had a correspondent. Here at home, once commercially successful genre, like drama and documentary, are becoming difficult to justify as audiences and advertising fragment. Inevitably, purely commercial players will, indeed already are, switching investment from those genre to the kinds of programs which, which offer a better chance of a term. <coughs> Reality TV, format entertainment and so on. Now there are some people, of course, who argue that a powerful BBC is bound to make all this worse. But there's no evidence that that's the case. This is a global phenomenon. Across the developed world, as people move from print to the web, traditional newspapers are in trouble. If anything, American papers are facing even more daunting problems than their British equivalents, with multiple closures and thousands of redundancies this year, despite the fact that in America there is no large-scale public intervention in broadcasting and no equivalent to the BBC on the web. Across Europe, the big advertising-funded channels, the counterparts to ITV, are seeing their audiences and revenues under pressure from new channels and other new forms of media. At a time when the future of so much of the rest of media is so uncertain, the idea of the BBC still works. That thought itself is infuriating, of course, for many of the participants in the debate. But it's true. It works in terms of investment, in high-quality production, in training. We are essentially now the only organisation training in broadcasting in this country. In talent. It works in innovation. But above all, it works for the public. And like the remarkable renaissance in so much of this country's cultural life, in music, theatre, dance, the crowds that flock to museums and galleries across the UK, it points to the fact that the idea of public space, publicly owned and available to the public, is not a piece of paternalistic nostalgia. It's about our present and our future. But what public space should consist of and where its boundaries should be set, these are lively and disputed questions, not least because they often involve trade-offs. Take religious broadcasting. Probably a majority of people in this country would accept that religion has an important place in the public square. Certainly the BBC remains committed to a significant volume of religious output across radio, TV and the web. From the morning service on Radio 4 to Donald McCulloch's History of Christianity, which we talked about a moment ago, which is playing currently on BBC 4, there's a central and unwavering commitment to Christianity, but a determination also to find space for the UK's other major faiths as well. But in what proportion? And what is the BBC's responsibility for non-believers, and specific, specifically for those humanists, for instance, who have sophisticated belief systems which they believe guide their lives and the moral choices they make, but who reject the supernatural and spiritual claims of religion. 
Humanists appear frequently across our output, especially on programs of ethical discussion, like the moral maze. But should they also appear sometimes on Thought for the Day, alongside the Christian, Muslim, Hindu, Sikh, Jewish, and other religious speakers who currently occupy the chair? Their case is simply that it's unreasonable to exclude one class of belief system from an important slot, <coughs> the whole point of which is to bring a range of different perspectives and patterns of belief to bear on the major events and talking points of the day. Now, while we accept that that argument has considerable weight, and that it's right that we should find ways to reflect humanism, atheism, and other non-religious belief systems on the airwaves, we've always taken the view that the point of thought for the day is specifically to be a religious perspective on the world, and that therefore only religious speakers should appear. Thought for the day, in other words, helps reinforce a place for religion in that part of the public space represented by the BBC. When we do that, I accept, at least in this case, at the price of excluding the representatives of serious non-religious belief systems. Interestingly, as we speak, the BBC Trust is considering a complaint precisely on this topic uh, of, of humanist and other non-religious speakers on the Today programme. It's a good example, I think, of the way in which my judgment, in the end, as editor-in-chief of the BBC, is itself subject to scrutiny and challenge. It means we hear what the Trust can say on the matter at some point in the next days or weeks. But trade-offs and difficult judgments seem unavoidable if you have to, and we have to, define public space in practical and immediate terms by commissioning and broadcasting programmes and web pages. Is Jerry Springer the opera an appropriate programme for the BBC to broadcast? Here, freedom of expression, but perhaps more importantly, the right of the public to decide for themselves whether to watch or not, and if they do what to make of what they see, is pitted against the risk of offending a minority of the public. In this case, we decided to broadcast. Or what about the decision about whether or not to show an appeal on behalf of the Disaster Emergency Committee about the humanitarian crisis in Gaza? Many people, no doubt quite a few people here this afternoon, thought that we should have done. Instead, we follow the long-standing principle that we do not broadcast charity appeals in circumstances <coughs> which could suggest that the BBC felt differential sympathy for one side or the other in an ongoing war. We would not, for instance, have felt able to broadcast an appeal had one been requested a few months ago for the conflict in Sri Lanka. Now, whether you think we were right or wrong, I hope you can see that here, too, there are important interests to balance. The humanitarian need, of course, one that we ourselves help to highlight to the world through our news output. Providing opportunities for the public to find out about and then to respond to human need is itself an important mission for the BBC, and an important aspect <coughs> in public space. Most year, BBC charity appeals and events encourage the British public to donate around £100 million to good causes. <coughs> but in this case, we felt we had to, against that, weigh our primary duty, which is to independence and impartiality. And in the event, we decided that the danger that the public might doubt our impartiality was sufficiently great that we should not walk. Impartiality is probably the biggest value, the biggest single benefit that the BBC brings to the national debate. We don't tell the public what to think or who to vote for. Instead, we try to give them the information with which to make up their own minds and to stage fair debates in which a whole range of political, social and cultural opinions can be heard. So much media preaches to the converted. People buying the newspaper or looking at the website which they already know will reflect back views which are already very like their own. <coughs> the BBC is different. First, it's very widely used. The latest figures suggest that around 98% of the UK population uses the BBC each week. Our news output alone reaches over 80% of the people in this country, not to mention around 250 million people around the world each week. So it's widely used. But second, is this point about impartiality. The combination of the BBC's reach and its impartiality means that most people are almost bound to bump into fresh perspectives or to find themselves witnessing and perhaps taking part in real rather than artificial debates about the subjects that matter most. 
This sense of a debate which is open to all, which excludes no one, is the essence of what I mean by public space. But it isn't easy. Impartiality is at once the most important, but also the most disputed of all the BBC's duties. And to illustrate that fact, I thought I'd look briefly at one recent case study, our decision to invite Nick Griffin, the leader of the British National Party, uh, to appear on our programme Question Time. Question Time epitomises what I've been talking about in terms of its breadth and its openness. Politicians from the UK's biggest parties appear most frequently, but from time to time representatives of parties with many fewer supporters, from the Scottish Socialists to Respect to the Green Party, also take their seats on the stage, as do a whole range of non-politicians with something to say. Question Time is the most prominent programme of its kind on British TV, and we carefully <coughs> study the support gained in elections by each of the parties, large and small, before deciding who to invite and how frequently they should appear. <coughs> and it's a straightforward matter of fact that with some 6% of the vote and the election of two MEPs in this spring's European elections, and some success in local elections as well, that the BNP <coughs> has demonstrated a level of support that would normally lead to an occasional invitation to join the panel on question time. And it's for that reason, not for some misguided desire to be controversial, certainly not to get bigger ratings, but for that reason alone that the invitation was extended. For the BBC to say to the BNP, or indeed to any political party, yes, you've met the objective criteria for appearing on question time, but we've decided that in your case it would be far more appropriate if we didn't do that, but maybe the subject of an investigation on power armour, uh, or put you on Newsnight, will be for us to deny them parity with other parties, presumably on the basis of our own, or somebody else's qualitative political judgement about the BNP. And that isn't impartiality. It is the opposite of impartiality. It would be, in my view, contrary to our obligations under the BBC's charter, and contrary to the British public's expectations of us. It would be wrong. Does that mean that the BNP should not be challenged? Of course not. They should be challenged as tenaciously and as searchingly as any other political party. And I believe that they are when they appear on the BBC. From news coverage to hard-hitting and indeed award-winning investigative journalism, we've probed both the BNP's stated policies and some of the views of the party's leaders and supporters that are expressed only behind closed doors. But the point about question time is that it's the public's chance to challenge the politicians. And that is why it is so important that they should sometimes be able to hear and interrogate politicians from the relative fringes as well as from the mainstream. Political parties, of course, have the right to be treated fairly and even, even handily by the BBC. But the central right we were upholding in this decision was the public's right to hear the full range of political perspectives, to hear other members of the public putting those perspectives to the test, and then to form their own conclusions. Excluding any party with demonstrable popular support from taking part in the programme would have been to curtail this public right. The case against inviting the BNP on question time is, I believe, in the end, a case for censorship. In other words, within the opinion of those people who make this case, the BNP's policies are so abhorrent and so liable to so hatred and division, they should be excluded from this part of the public space altogether. Now, democratic societies sometimes do decide that some parties and organisations and some opinions are beyond the pale. As a result, they prescribe them or ban them from the airways. The UK government took exactly this step with specific parties and organisations in Northern Ireland in the 1980s. Now, many would argue that prescription and censorship can be counterproductive, and it's usually better to engage and challenge extreme views than to try to eliminate them through suppression. It's not the point I want to make. My point is simply that the drastic steps of prescription and censorship can only be taken by government and parliament. Though we argued against it, the BNP abided by the Northern Ireland broadcasting ban in the 1980s. And if parliament decided to prescribe the BNP, the BBC would abide by that decision too. The BNP would not appear on question time. But that hasn't happened. And until such time 
as it does, it's unreasonable and inconsistent to take a position that a party like the BNP is acceptable enough for the public to vote for, but not acceptable enough to appear on democratic platforms such as Question Time. If there is a case for censorship, debate it and decide it in Parliament. Public space is not just a place reserved for works of art or political parties or opinions which we ourselves approve of or which some other specific section of society approves of. What makes it public is not just the fact that anyone can wander into it as a spectator or observer, but also that pretty much anyone can go into it and offer their intellectual and cultural wares as well. There are limits, of course there are, limits set by the law. For example, the law against incite incitement to racial hatred, the laws against the sexual abuse and exploitation of children, or by widely held conventions like the nine o'clock watershed. Within these limits, in my view, BBC's presumption should be, however, in favour of inclusion rather than exclusion. And it's the BBC's own public status, its charter, and its guaranteed funding that makes such a stance possible. Because it's one that many private media organisations might quite reasonably shy away from. <coughs> Looking at the crowds of demonstrators and the police outside television centre a few weeks ago, most private media bosses might well conclude that they simply didn't need the grief. They don't have a duty to represent the full range of political views, and they're unlike to feel it makes good commercial sense even to try. This, I think, is a good example of an area where it's very hard to argue that profit is a guarantor of independence and diversity. On the contrary. And it's not what the public want. Surveys after the programme suggested that around three quarters of the Question Time audience and of the public at large thought we were right to invite the BNP onto the programme. This edition was watched by three times as many people as a typical programme with an unusually young audience. And although the decision to invite them was made without reference to the likely physical impact on the fortunes of the BNP, it's interesting that the evidence so far suggests that far from boosting the party's poll rating, support for the BBC has, if anything, slightly reduced since the transmission. The BBC has persisted, and despite many bumps over the years, has retained public confidence precisely because it's never allowed itself to stagnate. And the last thing we should do now is to sit on our laurels. Nor should we remove ourselves from the rest of the media sector. The public will be best served not by a strong BBC sitting in isolation, but by a strong, varied media sector and a strong public service sector, which includes a strong BBC. It's only three years since we last had a really good look at our strategy. We came up with a set of plans which included the BBC iPlayer, our seven-day catch-up service, a radical rehaul of what we do on the web, including high definition, including mobile services, but it also included a concentration of investment in areas like drama and specialist factual programmes and programmes like Life, the, the Attenborough um, uh, Natural History series running on BBC One right now is a really good example. We've got more science and natural history on BBC One than we've had 20 years. So we did a lot in that, in that exercise. But in the three years since we did it, the world, especially the world outside the BBC, has changed frankly beyond recognition. Digital take-up and the public's use of digital services has exceeded almost everyone's predictions. And the effect of that, and of the downturn, the effect on many incumbent media businesses has been devastating. Now inevitably, as I hinted earlier, that's meant a steady increase in the number of those who worry about the BBC's scope and its market impact. Convergence is now an everyday reality. And as I said, companies who want to regard themselves as being in a very different market from the BBC now believe their meeting is head to head. Now you've heard me argue um, this afternoon that James Murdoch's diagnosis of the ills of British media misses the point. But I don't want to go so far as to suggest that every question about how the BBC fits in alongside the British media, how this part of public space fits in with the private space in the media, that every question is illegitimate or is a partisan attack on public service broadcasting. 
the world has changed, the BBC must consider how it changes too. Five years ago, we said, quote, the BBC should be as small as its mission allows. And in absolute terms, it is smaller. Thousands of jobs, some 7,000 jobs, have gone over the past five years. Whole divisions, technology, <coughs> play out of our television services. The outside broadcast division are no longer part of the BBC, have been sold off um, and merged with others. That high watermark of a new linear service talk, which is all those television and radio channels we launched at the beginning of this decade. It's years ago. The high watermark passed. Um, new services from the BBC, the iPlayer is a really good example. They aren't new pieces of content, they're not <coughs> whole new bodies of content. They're new convenient ways for the public to get the content that the BBC is already making. So actually, already, the scope of what the BBC does in the public service in the, U in the UK has reached its limit. And in absolute terms, we are more than we were. But we have to accept that given what's happened outside and what is happening outside, that to many in commercial media, we seem relatively bigger and more powerful than we've ever done. That's why I think it's inevitable that questions about the BBC and our services have come to the fore. Back this June, um, the BBC Trust, our governing body, and I decided that we should, given how much had changed, take another deep look at what kind of BBC we wanted in that world, rather exciting, but in some ways rather terrifying world, <coughs> media beyond 2012. 2012 is the moment of the analog to digital switchover in television. Um, what kind of BBC do we want, both in terms of the services we could deliver directly to the public, but also the relationship we have with the rest of the UK media, um, the, the other public service broadcasters, but the whole media sector. And right now, we are in the middle of what I think is the most profound review of what we do that I can remember in my time at the BBC. It's going to be radical, um, it's going to be open-minded, and I hope it's going to also confront real choices. Over the past two decades at the BBC, we've been able to use the productivity gain that have been made possible by new technology. And indeed, over that time, that's been enhanced to some extent by a licensing which has grown in real terms. We've been able to use those gains to reinvest and to opt for what you might call a both and strategy. Keeping really strong programming, for example, on BBC One, Radio Four, but also launching new digital services at the same time. The British public tell us they want a really strong, confident BBC with a clear mission and which delivers real value to every household in the country. But we also have to confront the fact that in a period where not just the licence fee, but the wider public finances and the revenues available to commercial media are all likely to be constrained. And after years, by the way, of trying to squeeze efficiencies inside the BBC, that's beginning to run out as a source of, of revenue. That world of both and, we can do this and that, and we can offer high quality traditional services and launch new ones, that world of both and will have to give way to either or real choices. Now we'll have conclusions, I hope, from this review early next year. But without preempting them, I can tell you that I expect to see a further shift of emphasis in favour of investment in high quality original British content and especially in those areas which are least likely to be provided by the market. The best journalism in the world, we hope, available to the public here and around the globe, free at the point of use. A long-term commitment to outstanding British content for children. A bolder strategy for programmes which build knowledge about the arts and science, and some of those programmes to be scheduled even more prominently than at present. A determination to open up the BBC's archive and make it as widely available as possible. Partnership will be a central theme too, partnerships with other broadcasters, sharing technology and infrastructure to help them continue to support public space in their own way. But also partnership with many other public bodies, working for instance to liberate their archives and make them available to the public. To give just one example, early next year we launch a new program on Radio 4, which is called The History of the World in 100 Objects. The programme is itself a 
partnership between BBC and the British Museum, and is presented by the BM's director, Neil McGregor, which in my view is one of the greatest broadcasters in the cultural space that we've got. Each episode of the programme uses one artefact from the museum to illuminate one chapter in the world's history and culture. But the programme won't just live on Radio 4. There's a companion TV programme for children on CBC. <coughs> There's additional output across national, regional, local services. A really massive and exciting presence on the web. And literally scores of partnerships with museums and galleries in every part of the UK. So having heard or seen one of, one, about one of these objects, you can find something similar, something connected to it physically in a, in a museum or a gallery. Near, near you. In its way, the history of the world in a hundred objects is an attempt to join up one part of public space. And I think it points to a new and rather different, a rather exciting vision of what the BBC could become. A bit less of a citadel with its own institutional priorities and interests, and rather more of a catalyst for collaboration and change. Now, given the scale of the challenges, there's an air of pessimism about much of British media at the moment. And given the ferocity of some of the attacks on us over the past few years, some understandable nervousness amongst the BBC supporters <coughs> about the future of the BBC itself. But I want to end by saying that I believe that the fundamental contract between the British public and the BBC remains strong. The case for a major public intervention in broadcasting and the web is probably more compelling today than at any point in our history. Although there are, probably always will be those who dispute that, and dispute the whole idea that there is any third way, any path between the market and the state, they are, and I believe they will remain, in the minority. And the opportunity for the BBC and for others, not just to defend the concept of public space, but to transform it and to use the new technologies and new media to populate it with amazing new ideas, the opportunity to forge a new relationship with the public within that space, that opportunity is greater now than it's ever been. Thank you. all sorts of questions over the next 10 to 20 minutes. I don't know if, Francis, you might like to act as the chair of this, this part of the... Feel free, Father. Your, well, your ears <laughs> are better for this purpose than mine are. Okay, so, do we have any questions? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> we did Walmart the at least one troublemaker tonight. <laughs> Coming as I do from Cornwall, I wanted to ask a question of where in the, as you've been down to sketch out that picture, where is Cornwall? Where is the regional, <laughs> regional broadcasting? Well, it's, really, it's incredibly interesting um, because I think so many of these debates come, come um, to a head. Um, uh, let me tell you two, two different stories. And it's a really good example of the challenge we face. We are essentially, we think, pretty much the only, only, only broadcaster um, in the world who can, with conviction, assemble a kind of grid which basically